My dad is a logger, specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to specified length, which means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forests. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is that he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees, and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut, not on how long it took him. So my dad used to work 16 to 20 hour days constantly to get done as quick as possible, and then the rest of the crew would come clean up the trees and ship them to the mill. He used to work around 50% of the time alone, and the rest of the time with another tree saw operator named Rennie. They would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. This is relevant down the line. Sorry for all the backstory, but this is the start to the story. My dad and Rennie were put on a new job site and were about 10 days in, and everything was going as planned but they were constantly hearing weird chitter chatter over the radio that was such poor quality, no words could be made out. As they progressed through the job and went farther up the mountain, the words from the radio slowly became more audible. Both of them agreed, based on the small parts of conversations they could hear, that something was wrong. They also started finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been here. People should not have been here. This was a two and a half hour drive up a mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road so their trucks and equipment could make it up. They came to the realization that they are in a very secluded area with people who shouldn't be there. And the worst part is that they aren't scheduled to leave for about another week. They would only leave to refuel the fuel truck with gasoline for the machines. They would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Rennie comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate the tent and find one lone sleeping bag and a duffel bag. They investigate the duffel bag and find many pairs of children's underwear and things that appear to be a rape kit, like rope, duct tape, sketched images of children being molested, and photographs of children that appear unaware they are being photographed. In the tent, they also find a small amount of food, which includes canned goods and an apple, which proves the tent has been occupied recently because there was no mold on the apple. They are now on the mountain alone, with which at best case scenario is just a really fucked up individual. Rennie instantly wants to get the fuck out of there, but my dad, being the hardest working person I've ever met, insists that they need to finish the job and get the fuck out of there. They decide that they will not talk over the radios except in cases of emergency and see if they can hear something over the radio. They are now in close enough range of whoever has been talking over the radio to hear the conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal except for the fact that these guys don't fucking belong here and that the tent was undoubtedly theirs. At the end of the workday, my dad hears them on the radio talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad hops on the radio and attempts to communicate with them about what the fuck they are doing. I believe he said, Who are you and what are you doing here? After this, the conversation between the men abruptly stops and they never pick up. That night, Rennie wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun, someone's outside. My dad has told me that the first thing he hears when he wakes up is the quiet shuffling of footsteps. My dad fumbles for his gun and finds it but realizes that he fucking doesn't have it loaded and has little clue where his rounds are and Rennie has nothing and the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob and it opens. The camper is far enough off the ground to where you had to jump in and there is no ladder footstool. It just stays open and neither my dad nor Rennie move. They hear scratching right outside the door though. After four minutes of scratching, my dad can no longer take it and nods at Rennie. He gets up quietly and walks towards the camper door. 
and the second he reaches it, he is met with intense pain across his right eye, all the way to his left cheek. He has been cut and falls out of the camper, hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him, and he is soon being kicked in the top of the head by a man behind him. Rennie leaps out of the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad, and my dad gets up and realizes that the second man without the knife is running away, and the man with the knife is scrambling away from Rennie and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Rennie get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cuts, and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up the job, one of them was found gagged, bound, raped, murdered, and thrown into a ditch. No one has ever been convicted of these crimes. To this day, my dad can hardly see out of his right eye and the pupil is disfigured and looks more like a cat's eye than a human's. He suffers PTSD from these events and hasn't slept a good night of sleep since. Back in the summer of 2012, when I was 11, I spent the night at my best friend Anna's house pretty regularly. She lived in a very wooded area, so her entire backyard could be considered a forest. We loved playing in it, and I practically never went inside when I was at her house. Because her entire backyard consisted of trees, there weren't many places to put things, like a trampoline for instance, so they had to place it pretty far back in a small clearing. We were very naive kids and believed that nothing could happen to us in the woods. We were so sure of it that we played around in them at night as well. One night in particular, we decided that we would go and play on her trampoline in the clearing. The trampoline was very old, and I was surprised it could still hold people. It didn't have a net either, which I hated because I feared I would go flying off one day with nothing to catch me. We took our shoes off and climbed onto the trampoline. Something about jumping around in the dark was exhilarating. I was having a blast, but as we continued to jump, the atmosphere changed. I couldn't tell what it was, but the woods seemed darker and more intimidating than before. Anna stopped jumping and completely froze, staring off into a specific spot in the woods. I stopped too and looked at her. There's a person, she whispered, pointing to the direction she was looking. My eyes widened and I turned my head to look for myself. Sure enough, there stood a tall, shadowy figure of a man. He noticed and tried to slightly hide himself behind one of the thick trees. He was still visible though, and absolutely terrifying. We both stood, frozen, and unable to yell out or run. We just stared at him. He was a bit further back, but we could still see every movement. He slowly moved out from behind the tree, my eyes moved to his hand and I could tell that he was holding something. I had no idea what it was, but it made the entire situation even scarier. Anna's senses finally kicked in and she pushed me to move, screaming for her mom. I flew off the trampoline making one big leap and landing hard on the ground. I was once thankful that there wasn't a net on her trampoline. Anna began to run, but I looked back first. The man had began to run after us as well, and he was fast. I screamed like I had never screamed before and took off for her house too. It felt like hours had passed before we reached her back porch. We threw ourselves into her living room. We were both actually laughing from hysteria, but the fear I felt in my stomach was sickening. Her mother, after hearing what had happened, stomped onto the back porch and looked around the backyard. She couldn't see anything, but she yelled at them to get away while they still could. I'm happy to say that we never saw that guy again. Of course, going around the woods at night would never happen again. And I hope that I will never have to experience another encounter like that for as long as I live. When I was a junior in college, my friend invited me to attend a ballet with her and a teenage girl she knew from back home. 
the girl was part of an educational advancement program that had placed her in a nearby high school and provided free room and board in a group home with other students. All of her housemates had gone home for fall break, so my friend thought it would be nice to take her out for a girl's night away from that big empty house with only her program advisor for company. It was about midnight when we got back from the ballet. Since we were in possession of a 16-year-old overdue for curfew, it seemed important to get her home as quickly as possible. The girl's house was fairly close to a student shuttle stop on the far end of campus, so we figured we'd walk her home before doubling back. While moving up a footpath that leads into town, we realized her house backed up to the forest on the edge of the campus. Rather than walk all the way around, we decided to cross the forest. We didn't have flashlights, but my friend's iPhone flash could serve in a pinch, and the stretch of woods was sandwiched between the brightly lit windows of our dorms and those of the houses across the way. Several minutes into our hike, we lost sight of the footpath and the dorms. It was much darker now, and my friend was less certain we were walking the right way, so we paused to check our location. As we were all huddled, motionless, around my friend's phone, we heard a twig crack behind us. We turned around to find a young woman, presumably a student, standing a few yards away. Her hoodie was pulled up over her head, obscuring most of her face. She seemed enormous, but given that I am 5'3 and was flanked by two 5 foot ballet dancers, the threshold for enormity was low. She was silent for a moment, then asked us where we were going. We're headed into town, my friend answered. Where are you going? What do you need in town? We're taking her home, my friend pointed to the teenage girl. Where does she live? Not too far. Where are you going? Do you know how to get there? She started to walk closer to us. The teenage girl grabbed a fistful of my coat and inched closer to me. Yeah, we figured it out. Are you going toward campus or into town? Which way is it? Her house. She was now within a few feet. Her approach had slowed, but not yet stopped. My friend quickly blurted out, Just this way, good night. She was bluffing, but any direction away from the student seemed like the right direction, so we went along. The plan was a failure. Within seconds, I could hear her crunching the leaves just behind me. She was following close enough to touch me, and I sped up, certain I was about to get a knife in my spine if I didn't get away. When my friend saw me rushing, she turned back to see the student following us. She grabbed the teenager's hand, and the three of us began to run. We never turned back, so I'm not sure how long the student followed. Eventually, we figured out we were running the right way when the teenager yelled out, That's it! and led us to a driveway where we could huff and puff ourselves back to normal under a garage-mounted floodlight. The girl's program advisor was home, waiting up for her missing ward, and made us each a cup of tea while we waited for the campus police to drive out and escort me and my friend back to our dorm. Once safely in the back seat of a college security vehicle, we told the officer why we'd wanted a ride instead of walking back. He said this was the third time this semester they had picked up students running scared from the woods after encountering a strange girl in a hoodie. They dispatched officers to look into it before, but they never found anyone. He figured it was a student on a stroll from the dorms and we had nothing to worry about. As soon as we got out of the car, my friend got a text from the teenager. She was certain she'd seen the student outside her window, but when the program advisor went out to investigate, no one was there. I never found out what happened, but I really hope the creepy girl in the woods is not the same student whose body was found out there a year later. I hope she had nothing to do with that at all. I grew up in a town in a relatively rural part of England. Once upon a time, the whole area had been ancient woodland, but by the time I grew up there, urban sprawl meant that only a few small pockets of woodland remained. 
entirely surrounded by housing estates. I hated walking through those woods. The quickest way to get anywhere from the street I grew up on was to take a footpath that ran from one end of the street around the back of the houses and then through maybe a quarter of a mile wide patch of woodland before you reached the heart of the town. It only took a few minutes if you took the most direct path through, but my heart would be racing the whole time. I had to walk through there to get to school or to the shops when my mom sent me to get groceries, and knowing that, my older brothers would tell me that the woods were haunted by the ghosts of people who had been hung at the gallows that once stood there. When I was a teenager, I became scared of the woods for a different reason. During the winter months, when it was already dark, when I walked home from school, older kids would sometimes lurk amongst the trees to scare the shit out of smaller kids and demand what little money they had, or sometimes even their mobile phones. But I'm an adult now, so when I visited my mom in my hometown last winter, the woods no longer held any fear for me. It had snowed properly for the first time in a few years, and my mom, in typical mom fashion, immediately informed her elderly neighbor that her daughter was visiting and would happily take her dog for a walk so that she didn't have to risk the icy pavements. The morning after I arrived back there, I found myself walking down that footpath into the woods with a fat, gray, around-the-muzzle old Labrador in tow. It doesn't often snow in the city I live in now, so I decided to take a recent purchase, a good DSLR camera out with me to photograph the scenery. The fat old dog and I wandered around the woods for 20 minutes or so, the dog hobbling a bit in the snow and occasionally making a half-hearted attempt to chase wood pigeons while I snapped photographs of snow-laden branches and the stark black and white landscape. It was quite early on a Sunday morning, so nobody else was around and there were very few other footprints in the snow. I was quite enjoying the walk, but I had started to get a bit cold and didn't want to exhaust the neighbor's dog too much, so I was just about to head back when I heard something moving quickly through the woods toward us. Someone was heading rapidly down the main path. The dog and I were currently out of view on a side path, but only for a few more seconds. I don't really know why it occurred to me to hide, but I did without really thinking about it. I hesitated for a moment, and then, mindful of memories of being threatened by hooded teenagers and robbed of my very first brick-like phone, I stepped off of the path and hid among the bushes and trees. The lens on my camera at the time was worth about the same as a month's rent and I guess I was worried that some opportunistic robber would see it and decide that I was an easy target. The dog hesitated for a moment as I tugged at his lead, but followed me into the bushes just in time. I crouched down with a hand on his head, willing him to be still and quiet. As a person came into view on the path just a few feet away, I didn't really get a good look at them, but I saw that it was a man, tall, and wearing a dark jacket and a red baseball cap and moving in a hurry. Thankfully, the dog remained quiet and then the man was gone. When the man was well out of sight, the dog and I stepped back into the path and I decided to take a few more pictures before we left. When we were finally heading home, the near silence of the woods was broken by the loud drone of a helicopter overhead. I couldn't see it clearly until we were on the footpath behind the houses and out from under the trees. But once there, I could see that it was a police helicopter and it was circling over the woods. I returned the fat old dog to my mom's neighbor without any incident and completely forgot about the helicopter until a little later when my mom switched the radio on in her kitchen so that we could listen to some music while we ate lunch. It was a local radio station, and their top news story was that the police were hunting a man who had beaten someone nearly to death on a secluded footpath earlier that morning. The path they described linked the woods I had been walking in to the center of town. The suspect was described as tall, wearing a dark jacket and a red hat. 
I saw him fleeting the scene of the crime, and it was only my paranoia about my new camera that prevented me from meeting him in the middle of the woods, early in the morning with nobody else around. I don't know what would have happened if I had stayed on the path, but I'm glad I never found out. His victim on the other footpath survived, but it was a very close thing.